Now today we will particularly consider the character of Boaz. This name is first found uh, in chapter 2 of Ruth. Of course this name appears in other uh, books, in other contexts, with reference to others, but as far as Boaz of the book of Ruth is concerned, he first appears in chapter 2. And I will not read the text uh, right now, but we will look at them as we proceed. Nonetheless, we will read verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. A wealthy man, a mighty man, his name was Boaz. So I've entitled our study of God's word as the righteous rich, Boaz the righteous rich. The Bible declares in 1 Samuel 2, 7, listen to this. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and he lifteth up. 1 Samuel 2, 7. Uh, this is a clear statement of the word of God. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. You know, I'm addressing the rich in today's message. But that does not make anybody think that you, if you are a poor person especially, that you are ignored. No. The very fact that you are poor as you are and trust the Lord is the Lord's doing. The Lord knows very well that they are poor and rich and he takes ownership of them. You know, there are people who work very hard in life and still very poor. There are people who work very little and they are rich because some of them inherit their wealth from the parents. Or somehow their business, they themselves do not know, somehow it worked. But then there are also those who are rich by deception and all kinds of wicked ways. Did the Lord make them rich? Of course, God allowed them to be rich. Not that he, he taught them to do those things, but he allowed them whatever they want. So that their life may become a lesson to the rest of the world. You do this way, you will have the consequences. Any world that comes through wickedness will soon vanish and it will have its pain. And all these things are very clearly taught in the scriptures. So I want to say at the very beginning of my message that if you are a poor person, if you are struggling with the difficulties that you are faced with, please understand this. The Lord is still your God. He takes ownership of you. But the rich must also know your wealth in any way pluck you away from God. You are still accountable to God. The rich must know they must not forget God because they have more than enough. If God doesn't give them the wealth, it will not be with them. God is the one who gives us power to make wealth. So both the poor and the rich must equally trust God. Boaz was a rich man. I believe God made him rich. There are some very rich people in the book that we read and believe and obey. Abraham was a rich man. Before him, Job was a rich man. Jacob was also quite rich, but then they had to go through poverty because of famine. Then Joseph went over to Egypt. The Lord prospered him. So Jacob and other children went to Egypt to live with Joseph, who became very rich. 
And Joseph was very poor. In fact, he was in dungeon or in prison. From there, the Lord raised him. So we can see how God's hand work to bring one law and to bring the same up. It's in God's hand. Now, if you are poor, please don't think that you will be always poor. God can change you. You do what God wants you to do. Work hard in the righteous way. God can turn your fortunes. Now, I want to also warn those who are rich. Look, God can turn your fortunes. From riches to rags, it will not take more than a second. So trust the Lord. Everyone must believe that God takes ownership of the poor and the rich. But so often it is true that rich people are very powerful people. They are very powerful. They seem to have so much influence. Everybody wants to be their friend. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, we are told rich has many friends. But be careful what friends you would have for yourself. If the rich are going to take friends from the wealthy and the powerful, God will not be their friend. That's one of the messages we are going to hear very clearly from the life of Boaz. So take note, in verse 1 of Ruth chapter 2, we are told that Naomi had a kinsman of her husband. Her husband was Elimelech, so Elimelech's relative, a close relative. And he was a mighty man of wealth, a man of great wealth and riches, of great power and authority. Some commentators believe the reason why he is referred to as a mighty man was because he was a judge. He, he probably had certain uh, political or administrative status in the society. He played an important role in guiding people in, in making sure that God's law is properly maintained in the land. He was a mighty man, a man of authority, in other words. And he was rich as well. And his name was Boaz. The word Boaz means in him is strength. That's the meaning of the word Boaz. In him is the strength. So he had the strength of riches. He had the strength of power. He had the strength of virtue and grace and godliness. As a man who would be the perfect example for all of us. Many years ago, one man told me, who came to our church, Pastor Koshi, I like your preaching, but I can't appreciate the kind of difficulty that you went through. He said, I would rather you be like Dr. S.H. Toe, rich and a pastor. You are just the opposite. You are a pastor, but poor pastor. Well, I said, well, I don't wish to be like Dr. S.H. Toe because that's not God's plan for me. He tend to think that I will be greatly admired by people if I'm rich. Maybe true. Well, that's not my calling. You see, if I'm not rich, it doesn't mean God will not have a ministry for me. But if somebody is wealthy, praise God. God had made that person wealthy. And he is given certain kind of uh, power, certain kind of attraction, certain kind of influence. I don't want to be jealous about it. If it is from God, it has to be so. And we must acknowledge God's goodness in that person's life. But dear friends, there is something that I want to say. Even though the scripture says our experiences in life are directly related to God's own sovereign decrees and plans, yet we have a part to play. God's sovereign decrees and plans also require us to respond in obedience to God's word. If you are lazy, you don't expect to be rich. Because God's sovereign plan that, that includes a person's wealth, 
requires such a person to work hard, to be industrious. If he is given a large piece of land, he can't just sit there and allow thistles and thorns to grow in his field and then be rich. No. He got to wake up early in the morning, plow the land, take out the weeds, remove all the thorns and thistles, sow the seed, fertilize the ground, water the plants, and work hard for the next few months until all the crops grow and ready to harvest. And then he got to harvest it, thresh it, winnow it, purify it, and sell it. It's hard work. Not everyone is born with a golden spoon in his mouth. Some are. But even to keep the wealth, it's a big struggle. In fact, the book of Proverbs says, wealth will not be for all generations. It will fly away like a bird. Wealth will put on its wings and fly away. So those who are born in well-to-do family, listen to me carefully. If you take it for granted and do not manage the things that God has given, it will be gone in no time. One of the first things that I want to bring to your attention about this wealthy man, Boaz, is that he had a proper attitude toward God in the midst of all the wealth he enjoyed. Please turn to Ruth chapter 2. Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless thee. There are, much thing, there are many things that we can learn from this verse. But first of all, I want you to take note. He acknowledges God even before his workers. The very first thing that came from his mouth, the Lord. The Lord. He honors God. He did not say it for the sake of showing off his religiosity. It was a natural outburst of his heart, a believing heart. Some who are rich are so ashamed to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been to people who are doing very well, Christians, who have plenty of money, wealth. And I'm so amazed to see some people, how they honor God. So one day, you know, when I first started the Bible Witness, I asked a very well-to-do Christian man whether he would like to take some Bible witness and put uh, in his office. Because uh, in his office a lot of people come day, every day to meet him. He's quite a well-to-do man. And I said, uh, you know, I give you free, but just leave it there for people to read. You know what he said? It's not so good. He said, Why? Well, you know, this is not a spirit, religious place. I'm doing business. I don't want my customers to be intimidated by my faith. Wow. I don't want my customers to be intimidated by my faith. What does that mean? Wealth is more important than God. Business is more important than my faith. Consumer is divine, God secondary. This is very dangerous. I remember many years ago, I visited Tan Kan Singh, who is now a pastor of Berrien BP Church. He was a very, very uh, well accepted civil engineer in this profession. And I went to his office. Uh, actually, we were looking for a place for our own uh, church. You know, we had to move from our previous place. And I thought, uh, can sing, can help. And because he gave me a call and said, Pastor Koshi, uh, my boss has this building. 
and uh, I know the place is empty. Would you please come? I would bring you to my boss and we will talk about it. He's quite a wealthy man. I will help you. We will get this place for Getsemane BP Church. He was so kind. And he was not called Ed into the ministry at that time. So I went to his office. The moment I went there, whoa, tracks, tracks, and also st stickers. Praise the Lord. Uh, Jesus saves all these things on his, on his wall. Then I asked him, is your boss a Christian? He said, no, 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 he's a Buddhist. Then doesn't, isn't he offended by this? He said, no, no, he'll leave me alone. Are you not troubled that others would uh, sort of look at you as a fanatic? He said, no, I'm a Christian. And I've been always like that. It's all right. You know, it's not his office. It is a non-Christian man's office. But he is generous and kind enough to accommodate Kansing's faith. And he was huge in his testimony. He was really broadcasting his faith in the space that he was given. He was not ashamed about it. And he was so, he was so bold about the Lord and his goodness. Today he serves the Lord full time as a pastor. Uh, there are people who really amaze me by the way they declare the truth of the Lord. Boaz, the moment he came down to the field, the first thing he says, the Lord be with you. And the workers in harmonious response say, the Lord bless thee. Let every person who is prospering, whether it is in your teaching career, whether it is in your business or your medical profession or whatever be the thing that you are doing, please honor the Lord. Not, not in every place you can put a sticker. Not in every place you can uh, uh, play Christian music. But never, never be ashamed in acknowledging your Lord. Bear testimony to your bosses. Bear testimony to your workers. Bear testimony to your colleagues. Bear testimony to your fellow st students. Bear testimony to the Lord and his goodness in your life. Please, don't shut your mouth. But use it to praise the Lord who has blessed you. Let all the children who are doing well in the exams, when you are given your, your grade and the teacher congratulates you, let your tongue... Praise the Lord. Say, praise be unto God who helped me. Don't be ashamed to say it. Don't be ashamed. Bear testimony. I urge all the young ones and the older ones, do the best that you can in the areas that the Lord has appointed you. Do your best. Excel in your attitude, in your work, in the areas that God has given to you. But only to praise his name. Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 49. Verses 6 to 8. Psalm 49. Verses 6 to 8. Would you not read with me, please? Please read with me. 49, 6 to 8. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. You know what this passage tells you? Please remember, with all your wealth, you can never redeem your soul. With all that you acquire in this world, there is nothing that you can do to your own soul. It will perish and rot. It will rot and perish in your wealth. It is God's mercy that saved you. So if you are truly a born again Christian, do not forsake God. You see, God has not called us to flaunt 
our wealth, to show off our wealth, and to be proud about it. God has called us to glorify Him, isn't it? To glorify our Redeemer. Our wealth, our positions, our influence in this world is for that one purpose, to lift His name. So if God has given you a billion dollar, remember it is for His praise and not for your pleasure. If God has given you a unique position in the society, remember you are there to honor God. Use your opportunity to praise the Lord. You must remember something. If you don't, if you don't, people around you will think money is everything and they trust in wealth which cannot save them. And you will be guilty of their blood because you misled them by honoring money over the Savior's name. Many years ago, I visited a dentist and he looked at my teeth, it was not very good at the time, and he said, it was probably about 10 years ago, he said, he's, he's a Christian, and he said, Brother Das, uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you about your teeth. Unfortunately, you cannot reply me, all right? Uh, this is how I feel when you preach. When you preach, I cannot reply you. So just listen to me. <laughs> and he, he started to tell me about many things. And he said, you know, sometimes I think you pra preachers have a good opportunity to preach and lift God's name. And I get my opportunity when I ask people to open their mouth and then clean. And I can talk about God. And that's what he said. Well, praise the Lord. Well, I don't think you know, every uh, patient will sit there and listen. Some may just run out if you talk about Christ all the time. But at least you may say something about the Lord Jesus. And if, if the person is not happy, maybe you, said, you say to him, Okay, there is a track there for you to read. Whether you are a dentist or a pediatrician. Or maybe you buy some uh, scripture in... D, uh, scripture in song DVD and keep it. So when you see a uh, 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 little child coming to your clinic, give it to that child and let him go and hear the word of God. Keep some gospel tracts for children. I mean, whether you're a teacher or a pediatrician or a tuition teacher, it doesn't matter. Please lift the name of the Lord. Think about that soul's salvation. You see, we all must remember something. When we see our consumers or our clients, we should not be just thinking about money, but let's also think about their soul. Unfortunately, even Christians have fallen into this trap. When we see the people who do business with us, it's all dollar, dollar, dollar. Every man, dollar, dollar. Even pastors are like that. When they say the people, they immediately calculate. Oh, money. How much money? How can I make more money? Make money. That's how they think. It's very sad. From pastor to the peasant. Everyone is thinking about money when they see somebody else. We all have become a commodity in this time. Everyone is a business material for somebody else. That's how the world sees us. But the scripture says there is nothing more evil than that. With money you cannot redeem a soul. But the Lord has done it all. So please, remember, wealth is nothing without the Lord. And Boaz understood it. That's why he mentioned his name the moment he entered his field of work. The next thing that I want to bring to your attention is that Boaz not only had a proper attitude toward God, by acknowledging him in his place of work, praising him. But he also have proper management of the property that God has given to him. A proper management of his property or proper management of his business. You see, the Lord is a God of order. God is a God of tidiness and good management. He is not a God of chaos. And he expects all his people... To manage that which God has given to them in a proper and appropriate way. 
And it is God's desire for all his people. And we know that Boaz was such a man. Please look at verses 5 and 6 of chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. Then said Boaz unto his servant. See that singular. That was set over the reapers. And that's plural. Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. He knew his people. He knew who are, who are his workers. It's a large field. He came down to the field from the city where he lived and he immediately had his eyes scanning the field. He looks at everybody, okay, my workers are here, and the chief of the workers are there, the servant and the reapers, the one who is appointed over the workers. And he immediately noticed a girl in the field. He knew it's not his worker. And he calls the servant and says, who is that damsel? And he used a very nice word to refer to the lady. He was not being rude, and that he wanted to know. Who is that? Why is she here? Who is she? Now, you see, he did it very properly. He was not showing off his prowess and might and wealth by calling the, Come here, girl, who are you? No, he didn't do that. He called his servant who is in charge of the field. You know, sometimes... I have to learn this. Now, by the grace of God, we have many co-laborers in the church, full-time workers, and everyone is given a portion. Brother Paul Ching has been in charge of care ministry. Brother Daniel has been in charge of the Chinese service and the seniors' work. Brother Kelvin has been appointed in charge of the children's work. And we have missionaries in different places. And I've been supervisory pastor of the Philippine missions. But as soon as Reverend Rego was ordained, I said, Brother, now you are in charge. When Dominino went to Bogo, I told him something repeatedly. And I have to emphasize to him later. You are under Reverend Regor and the session of Cebu. Do not ever have the attitude to Reverend Regor that you are under pastor and Singapore gets him in a church and ignore him. That would be very wrong. And it's important that I also deal things correctly. If there's a problem in care ministry, it's not for me to right away bum into care ministry and ignore Paul, don't care where he is, What's the problem here? How can Paul do it? That's, that would be very terrible. I have no respect for him, isn't it? If something happens in Chinese service, I shouldn't be just rushing in and ignore Daniel and show off, you know, I'm the pastor. If something happens in the children's ministry, though I am the pastor, though Brother Kelvin work under my supervision, I should work through him. There's a proper way to do things. It's a proper management. So each one exercises his God-given part. You know, just because we are rich or just because we are about certain people, it does not mean we can have a way without thinking about God's appointment in each one's life. If God has given you a maid, and if you're given her to given her some duty, and if she's doing well, please don't go and tear the lady apart. And until you get angry, scratch, pull the hair, punch, and you land in jail. You've got to understand how you deal with people. There's a proper management of the things that God has given. If God has given you workers, it's God's gift, okay? It's not easy to, good get, to get good workers. They may not be perfect. I know Brother Kelvin is still learning. I know Brother Paul is maturing. I know Brother Daniel is less experienced than I am. 
It's all God's providence, but God has called them, God has given them a part. And I want to tell you that this happened in Gethsemane all the time. When I came first to Gethsemane in 1991, I was only about 24, going to 25. I was very young. Elder Mao was the chairman of the session or interim committee. And he did very well. But I can't, you know, just budge into him and disagree with him. Nonetheless, Elder Mao would listen to me because I was the preacher. Though I was not in the session, I was not even a Singaporean permanent resident. So I can't be a responsible person in the committee. You have to be a PR to be uh, in the committee in a responsible way. So I couldn't. I could only be an observer. And I was there. I did my part in explaining the truth. And sometimes we had debates. But I had to submit to Elder Ma. And Elder Ma did it very well. He never did anything without consulting me or talking to me. Even though I was not a valid member of the interim committee in terms of the requirements of the law, of the land. But you know, something I remember, as soon as the church decided to request for my ordination, Elder Ma said something to me, Brother Das, once you're ordained, it's you. And I never forget his message in Shalom BP Church when we were worshipping there. He said, I'm not the king, I'm only a kingmaker. Now pastor should lead. He's not saying Pastor Koji is a king, but <laughs> what he meant is that there is a time and a place for him. And he did it well, and he did it well. He still worked with me. He doesn't have the attitude, oh, you see, I was the first chairman, okay, Pastor Koji, you are after me. So, please, don't act like a pastor in front of me. No, he doesn't do that. By the grace of God in Gethsemane, we have been blessed with good attitude and proper management. That's why for the last, at least from 1991, since I came, there was no trouble in this place. There was no quarrel among the elders. There was no disrespectful behavior from anyone as far as the leadership is concerned. We had problems because of individual mistakes. That's of a different kind. But there was no conflict because we disrespected one another. And you have to learn this. The church will grow, missionaries will be added, more people will come into the ministry, but let every man know how to behave in the house of God as good stewards of the Lord. Just because one is above another, he has no, regard, no right to disrespect or disregard the duty that which is given to the one who is below him. You've got to respect him. So here Boaz comes, he doesn't take things into his hand, he calls the person in charge and says, what happened? Who is this girl? And he gives an account. And then he acts upon it. You know, it is very important, all of us who are in leadership in the church, or if you are in the managerial position of the business that is under you, or if you are the CEO, or if you have the honor of the business, then please understand this. Manage it properly as God wants it to be. With respect for the people whom God has given to you. And also with utmost care in handling these things. Would you please turn your Bibles to Proverbs 13, 11. Proverbs 13, 11. What do you read? Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. Watch the next one. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. There are two ways of getting wealth. One is by vain methods. That are ungodly means. Okay, whatever it be, cheating or grabbing the poor people's. Uh, money or snatching away the promotion that belongs to somebody, well, all this will disappear soon. It's just a matter of time. But those who labor and gather, they shall increase. We should work hard. Those who are in the ministry must preach the gospel. Reach out, reach out, reach out, and grow. And those who are in business, let them work hard. Labor. Wealth cometh by labor. That's God's principle. Nonetheless, 
I think it is also quite important for you to remember this. Would you also turn to Proverbs 23? Verses 4 to 5. Proverbs 23, verses 4 to 5. What does it say? Labor not to be rich. Ah. Oh. Labor not to be rich. What else? Cease from thine own wisdom. Verse 5. Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So dear friends. You know what the Bible says is this. Do not labor to be rich. In other words, when you labor, you don't labor because you want money. You labor because God has given you a labor. And you do it. If you labor for greedy, with a greedy heart, to accumulate and accumulate, you know, you are sure going to make mistakes. You are, become, you are going to be covetous, you are going to be greedy, and you are going to push people away. You won't respect people because you are with a mission to get whatever you can get. Anybody comes into your path taking the honor that you like to get, then you will react with great vengeance, destroying people. And that is destruction. So don't labor to be rich, but labor that in that which God has given. Do it well. Wealth cometh from the Lord. Promotion comes from the Lord. You know, I preach hard. You know, I, I, I don't mind to say, forgive me for being a bit boastful in this. I probably work harder than many pastors. And I spend lots of time studying, preaching, doing counseling and all that. To the point sometimes I have not, do not have enough sleep. But yes, look, how many people? I've been preaching for 15 or 17 years, 17 years. Look, still only 200 people. But there are people who just go in and start a church, take a guitar, sing some songs and shout, scream, roll around, do some rap dance tricks on the stage. They will get 1,000. And it comes in a month. So easy. No, I don't want that. I cannot desire that kind of crowd and wealth because that's not the path that God has set for me. It's to preach the word, not to tickle the ears of the people. Now look, everybody labor in this world, but some labor to be rich, but some labor to please the maker. The proper management of your business, your work, your Church is laboring to please the Lord. Wealth is something God gives to us according to his providence, according to his wisdom. Take note of one more thing from Proverbs 27. Would you turn to that passage? Chapter 27 of Proverbs. <clears throat> Proverbs 27, verses 23 onwards. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered, the lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are for the are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goats' milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance for thy maidens. See, this is God's blueprint for your labor on earth. You know, firstly, you are told, "Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks." And look well to thy herds. When God gives you an opportunity to do business. When God gives you a farm to work. When God gives you a flock of sheep. You know, do not just sit there and say, I am already rich. No, go down 
and take a look at your sheep. See whether they have fallen sick or not. Look after them. Take care of them like a real shepherd. You know, there are people who get a job and then after getting a job they have this snobbish attitude. <laughs> they better thank God for me. I'm such a good, clever man. You know, I've got all these degrees behind me. <laughs> they better be thankful that they got an experienced man like that. And then walk around in the office with such snobbishness, people trip on you and fall and die. Figuratively, of course. Please don't do that. Be humble. You know, your past experience and all the degrees you got does not make sure that your work will prosper. You got to get down and do the work. You got to pick one sheep at a time and see whether they are full of worms or some fleas. Whether they are clean from all the dirt and make sure they are clean and healthy. If there is one that is sick, you've got to te tenderly care for it. Otherwise, life will be difficult. Otherwise, these sheep will soon die. So the scripture says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. Look well to thy herds. So one has to manage the thing that God has given well. And that's my prayer. You know, though I said, care ministry is under brother Paul, Children's ministry under Kelvin, Chinese ministry under uh, Daniel Lim and Filipino service under Brother Dennis. It doesn't mean that I can now go home every day and sleep. Because I got people every corner. Now I don't have to visit anybody. I don't have to think about it. Pastor Goa, she has worked 15 years now, can sleep. What will happen? Oh, I don't even think what will happen. I'm not saying these people are bad. They are workers. They are hardworking people. They are faithful to God. But God has put me in a situation that I have to care for them. I got to guide them. I got to give advice. I got to listen to them. I got to have a watchful eye over it. But that's my calling, isn't it? And so you are in your situation. If you are a teacher, you know, sometimes I'm so fed up with my children's school teachers. I Hope they won't hear this, but let them hear. <laughs> I didn't mean to say this today, but you know, some of them have this attitude. They say, oh, Cornelius, you are in charge of the choir. I, I, I will come only at seven, uh, five o'clock and for one hour, but you must get all the choir uh, uh, students and start practicing at 12 o'clock. And he got to train the children from 12 to five and the fellow will come 5.30 and the children must go by 6.30. And they want to get gold with honors. I, I tell you, schools must sack some of these guys first. They have no responsibility. And when the children don't do well, you know who they go after? The person whom they appoint as the trainers for the children. And this is ridiculous. Of course I agree that children must be taught responsibility. Children must... Be given opportunity to lead, but not hands off. There's a great problem today. In the education system, they say, well, let the students do the research. Let, we give the topic, let them go to internet, and they search everything. And somebody once told me, why don't we do that in the church as well? You know, instead of pastor teaching all the time, just give a topic and let everybody in the church do the research on the internet and come back with their opinions. Oh my goodness, this place will be full of heresy. Hmm? Go and find out about the deity of Jesus Christ from internet. What will you get? If somebody comes to me and tell me, I'm a doctor and I became a doctor by doing all the research on internet. I tell you, I never want him to touch my body. Because there are all kinds of stuff on the internet. And if he's going to apply everything he learned from the internet, I think I'll be dead in seconds. But if you tell me I am tutored, I am mentored by so-and-so who is this surgeon in a famous medical university, and I think about it, I say, oh, good. Or if you are a student of that person, and if you have been taught by him, oh, please, come, help me. You better work on me. I need your help. You see, today, yes, I don't deny 
the usefulness of internet and all that. But I think and I detest that teachers and parents who take a hands off approach to the students and the children is a very dangerous crime. You are not managing your children. Train up a child the way it should go. Then it will not depart from the way that it should go. All these mediums are good, but they do not replace our duty to manage what God has given. And I hope you will learn this. And that's clear in the scriptures. Take care of your flocks that God has given. The third important truth that you must remember about Boaz, the righteous rich, is that he was a man with proper regard for the poor. A proper regard for the poor. Those who are righteous and rich, they will not look down on the poor, but they will bless the poor. You remember the greeting that he had? How The way in which he greeted? It was really amazing. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord be with you. What a way to bless the workers. Some of us, when we go into the office, are filled with jealousy and envy. You know, the guy who is un working under me, well, he's doing very well. I'm afraid that he may take over me. I dare not say the Lord bless thee, right? <laughs> In case my position is taken by you. <laughs> this is how we walk into the office. <laughs> Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Greed, even the cleaner that comes in. Talk with them. Gently deal with them. There's an Indian gentleman who wash our van almost every day. I pay him $40. Well, I'm not saying this because I pay him $40. Don't get me wrong. Uh, he's a very, very nice guy. When old man, he hardly can walk, but he cycles with a bucket of water at the back and he comes and wash them. You know, once in a while he comes up. He's a man full of respect. He's older, much older than me, probably in his late 60s. And he comes around. I had to greet him, isn't it? Oh, I said, did you wash the man? Every month you come to collect $40, right? Did you wash? You know, sometimes he comes in the morning to wash, and I'm not there, I'm elsewhere. Then he comes around in the afternoon. When he comes, he's not there, he doesn't wash the van, because the van was not there. So can I say, all right, you know, on that day I was not here. So that means that day you didn't wash. Then the following week, two days you didn't wash. So this month you didn't wash three months. Can I cut your pay? From $40, let's say $38.50. There are some people like this, you know. Ooh. When it comes to payment, they are so stingy. Every bit they want to ask for discount. If possible, take his bone and tissue also for discount. God hates this. I must tell you. The Lord hates this. And you also know, you know how Boaz invited Ruth to come and eat with him? You remember that? To drink the water he brought, to eat the bread he gave. And moreover, remember, I don't have to let you read that. We have read that. He also advised his servants to leave behind a handful of purpose. You remember that? That means purposely leave behind a bundle of sheaves for her to pick up. She wa he was generous, full of generosity, mercy upon mercy, kindness, compassion. Acts of gener generosity were flowing out of his heart. Just one day he did so many things for her. He said, look, you don't have to go to any other field. Stay in my field. Take as much as you want. Some of us would have said, hey, 
You came at 8 o'clock. You know what's the time? 10.30. Two and a half hours you were picking. Not enough. Huh? Go to other people's field. Huh? Why must pick here? It's already two and a half hours. Then you come back. The fellow is there at 3 o'clock. My goodness, you're still here. 8 to 3, you're still picking. You've got no other place. As though I'm the only one who got a barley field. Please go to somebody else's field. No. Boaz says to Ruth, stay with my young men. Pick as much as you want. And then secretly tells his servants, please put there some extra for her to pick up. My dear friends, Proverbs 22, 2 says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. This is a perfect scenario. The maker of the rich and the poor bringing them together. The rich and the poor meeting together. And where they realize God is the provider. Proverbs 22 2. Get some in a BB church. We must be like Boaz's field, where the rich meet with the poor and both praise God for the goodness. The rich comes to the church to praise God for all the blessings, and they bless the poor in the midst with their givings, and they also praise God for the gifts that God has given to them. This is the place where the rich and the poor meet together. But there was a sad scenario in the early church, according to James. Let's take a look before we close today's devotion. James chapter 2. It's a very sad scenario. It should never be the case in our church. James chapter 2. Verses 2 to 5. For if there come unto you assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that beareth the gay clothing. Well, this is not homosexual clothing. Gay clothing means very pleasant clothing, all right? As in old English. And say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. And say to the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. What a place to sit, under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? I have a word for the rich, those who are doing well. And have lots of savings in the bank. Do not despise the poor in this church. Because they have a greater faith than you. They live by trust and faith. Not by bread. But by the word of God. So before God let no rich man ever praise himself. Or think of himself as mighty about the poor. And I want to say a word to the poor. In Gethsemane PP Church, you don't have to feel bad or out of place. I'm a poor man. I am a poor man. I'm, I didn't say because I have nothing to eat. Because God has taken care of me in my poverty. I know it. I was a very poor man. I have enough, more than enough today. But I know what it is to be poor. And I'm willing to be poor any time because God takes care of me. And I want to tell you, dear friend, if you have walked into this congregation having nothing in your pocket, not even having money to put into that offering bag, will you not give yourself to God, your heart? God is your maker. He will never abandon you. You're welcome to your Creator. He offers you himself, his life, his blood that he shed on the cross. 
that you may be saved. And dear friends, those who are rich, now remember, you are made rich so that when you meet the poor, the poor may remember through you that we have a common creator, the Lord God of Israel. Blessed be his name.